C. The unconscious process of reproduction. A manifold organism becomes a reality as a result of the unconscious desire of a divine idea to exist, and it takes shape through infinite self-repetition in the form of an original shape, a monad, an original cell. How one or more new independent organisms can come forth from one organism, and how new ideas thus acquire life or maintain the species, are also highly important questions for psychology. Here we must form an opinion on this multiplication of souls. In some creatures, almost every monad, every primary cell, is capable of becoming a new independent organism. In others, cutting them in two causes each half to form a whole, with two souls reigning in the place of one. At first sight, these processes are most mysterious. Can an idea divide itself? Can violent mechanical separation cause one soul to become two, or several? These questions must be settled if we are to understand the infinite multiplication of the souls of animals and the materialization of more and more human souls destined for consciousness. We must be clear about the relationship of the species to the individual. The species does not exist as a pure idea, as a reality. It is a multitude of individuals. This relationship of species to individual is, so to speak, recapitulated in that of the individual to its elemental parts, the original cells. The individual exists through the development, destruction and reshaping of these original cells, just as the species lives in its individuals. Only the total sum of all those millions of monads continually disappearing and coming into being constitutes the individual. Any persons we see at a single point in time, be they child, mature or old, are but a part of the total ideal individual. The idea of the species therefore lives through being realized countless times in single individuals, just as the idea of the individual lives by its infinite self-repetition of the single original cell, the monad. Therefore, the idea of the individual is no more divided in the multiplication of individuals or monads than the idea of the triangle is divided when a number of triangles appear. In passing, I may say that every real triangle differs, even if only infinitesimally, from every other real triangle, since the idea is revealed in time and space, in the ever-fluctuating stream of elements, and thus under somewhat varying conditions. Similarly, every realization of the idea of the species in an individual, and every realization of the idea of the individual in a monad, will somehow, no matter how infinitesimally, differ from the others. This can be summarized as follows. The idea of the species... The idea of the individual and the idea of the monad should first be considered separately. Each of these ideas is capable of infinite manifestation. In one sphere of being there can be a countless number of different species. In one species a countless number of individuals. In one individual a countless number of monads. The higher the sphere in which the trinity of ideas reveals itself, the more each level will differ from the other. In humanity, every individual is essentially different from every other one, and from the whole of humanity as a species. Furthermore, each primary cell or monad is essentially different from the whole individual man. In the animal kingdom, and particularly among its lowest members, each individual of a species and is more and more like the next. Even the difference between individual and primary cell is almost non-existence, since the whole individual differs little from the primary cell itself. These differences must result in different methods of propagation. In the most primitive organism, where everything relating to the soul rests deep in the unconscious, and all reality is so similar that there is very little distinction between the individual creature and the primary cell, the concepts of individual and species will differ very little. All that is necessary to propagate a new member is the forceful separation of one or more primary cells by the unconscious drive of the idea. These individual primary cells at once act as a new whole. They are immediately active, like pieces of a chipped-off magnet, with their own north and south poles and their special attractions and repulsions. 
Of course, a large piece of magnetized iron may be considered a fragment of the Earth organism. So too, individuals created and propagated by splitting or separating have only a small degree of selfhood, and development of the idea towards any degree of consciousness remains quite unthinkable. It is interesting to note that the ease of production by mere partition and separation of primary cells is in direct relation to the immense propagation of these creatures. One of the infusoria can, in the course of a few hours, propagate millions of its type, and so on. The desire for existence of these ideas, which from the point of view of the sheer number of individuals produced is great, stands always in inverse proportion to the power and creative force of the resulting individuals. In the higher life spheres, and in the highest humanity itself, we find an entirely different and most remarkable situation. The higher energy of the idea of the individual causes a great difference between the organism as a whole and its elemental parts. While these elemental parts are capable of developing and completing their own organism, and of reproducing themselves, they are quite incapable of regenerating the entire organism by themselves, as can the monad, infusoria, the cut-off piece of the naiad, or the sprout of the hydra. Here a new individual can only come into being if the idea of the species is formulated anew, and this can never be done by one member alone, but only with the cooperation of two. The two members together represent the species each time. The new representation only comes into being when an elemental part, i.e. a primary cell of an individual, takes on the idea of the germinating ovum. Then, it is not merely the identical idea of that organism whose fragment this cell was, but a special new expression of the idea of the species that comes to life and is revealed in the egg. In the first case, the individual can truly propagate and multiply itself, its idea stating itself anew in elementary parts, needing only to be separated to reveal the same idea as a new organism. In the second case, the species represented by at least two members will do the propagating and multiplying. Once this situation is clearly grasped, a deeper understanding of both sexual procreation and the higher sphere of life in general is possible. Obviously, the idea of an organism which is revealed only when an ideal, the species, comes to life and is reasserted in it, must have a higher meaning than an idea which is recreated in every fragment of its own organism as an exact reproduction. The two actual procreating organisms represent an ideal, the idea of the species, an abstract concept. Together they establish an opportunity for one or more of the infinite number of ideas of individuals contained in that concept to emerge in life. The recent progress in psychology, which illuminates the development of man, is most instructive. But psychology also only receives its correct interpretation through an understanding of man's development. In all the higher creatures, certain remarkable primary cells are formed, each one being designed for the development of a whole new individual. These are the eggs in the ovaries. The higher organism would seem to imitate lower ones, where single primary cells separate, and the idea of the whole creature lives again in them. Here, however, development is not so immediate. This type of monad becomes a new human being only through the concept of the species. It must come unconsciously into direct contact with a living primary cell secreted by the male body, i.e. with a spermatozoon. Neither the woman nor the man produces the new individual alone. It is an individual manifestation of the idea of the species through the unconscious collaboration of both. A third factor altogether new results from the first two. We can now understand the independence of the new idea released by the two individual procreating ideas. This explains Hufelan's noteworthy law that the human sexes are maintained in equal numbers despite varied conditions of procreation. Moreover, although the procreating souls hand down a certain heritage to the newly revealed idea, each new idea is more or less essentially an original. With the act that makes the idea of the species of man flesh, 
another of the numberless ideas contained in the concept of humanity begins to come to life. Certainly, the manner in which mankind's procreative act is carried out influences the resultant idea. It will be correspondingly energetic and beautiful, or weak and inferior in energy. It is now generally clear how ideas, from the infinite number contained in the idea of humanity, emerge in life through a process of the unconscious realm of the soul. The partners of sexual intercourse really do not consciously bring about that contact that conditions the new life. This contact follows, incidentally, one or two days after intercourse in the very depths of the female organism. It remains to make several further pertinent observations. First, two facts demonstrate the higher dignity with which the idea of humanity realizes itself in, in its individuals. Productivity is far more limited in man than it is in the lower forms of life and a certain maturity and consciousness are necessary in the individual before he can carry out the reproductive function. The immense production and propagation of the lower forms of life in such a short space of time, and by the division and separation of primary cells, and by procreation in the primitive animal kingdom, is completely foreign to mankind. This process occurs within the human individual only in the rapid multiplication of primary cells in the first stages of life and during the early development of the organism. The second observation is that the maturity of the procreating individuals reveals a most remarkable relationship between consciousness and unconscious. A new form of the idea of mankind begins to live owing to the unconscious contact of original cells. Completely unconscious at first, this new individual cannot reproduce. At this stage, lower organisms begin to multiply endlessly. It must first become fully conscious. Only then will it be mature enough to cooperate in that unconscious contact with another unconscious idea. From that contact, a new idea comes into being. Again we see the cycle. Unconsciousness. Consciousness. Back into the unconscious. Finally, the deeper we study how an endless number of human individuals become actualized, the more we must try to understand accurately the causes of the immense differences among individuals. Although we know a priori that no reality in this world can be completely like another, the more individuals we compare, the more we shall learn about the divergences in human souls and modes of life. There are two reasons for these differences. One lies in the original divine thought of humanity and the other is inherent in the conditions under which these thoughts live. The idea of mankind as a species must already contain an infinite number of possible ideas, it being a higher idea than any other we know. As a result of that higher energy, the differentiation among individuals becomes all the more powerfully grounded in the original divine thought. Just as a large group is distinguished from a small one by the number of its units, so the differences among individuals are the main proof for the higher energy of the basic concept of mankind. We first notice one primary contrast throughout the infinity of individual ideas contained in humanity. A contrast repeating the world's first fundamental dualism, idea and ether. Purusha and Prakriti in Hindu philosophy, form and matter, the contrast between male and female. Thus, mankind, in its constant rebirth, continuously separates into the two approximate halves, male and female. This rebirth comes from the renewing union of these separated halves in the unconscious manner discussed above. Some inner necessity for a higher entity to divide symmetrically into two great contrasting halves is the only satisfactory reason, if only in its teleological significance, for that remarkable evenness of numbers of the sexes, first recognised and demonstrated by Hufeland. This symmetry is not found among other kinds of living creatures, where the majority may be on either side. Within this first dichotomy, there are many other contrasts. These two are based directly on the original idea of the individuals, and are heightened and awakened by the variety and mobility of life. 
One can describe the result as a number of spheres within spheres. But one law always prevails. The stronger the conscious life of the mind, the more decisive is the contrast among individuals, and the more obvious becomes the variety among human beings. It follows from this law that in respect to the primary contrast in mankind, the contrast between male and female, males are more strongly differentiated from each other than females are. A higher conscious mind usually develops in the male. This law applies equally to various stages of life, and even to the essentially different races of mankind, separated through the influence of the Earth's nature. Individuals are most alike in childhood, and they differ most greatly when the conscious mind is at its strongest. They also feel most attracted to each other at that time. The races of mankind are divided according to the four conditions of the planet, day and night, dawn and dusk, into the four great divisions of the day people, the night people, the people of the eastern dawn, and the western dusk. It is, of course, the day people in whom the day of the soul, consciousness, is most fully developed, Thus, their individual characteristics differ most. The night people are definitely more uniform, even in the original pattern of their soul. If the distinctiveness of individuality loses some of its edge even within the human species, this dulling effect is still more obvious when one looks at the life spheres of the animal kingdom. Only in mankind do we find the heightened individuality we call personality. In the animal kingdom, the lower one goes in the life idea of the species, the less individuality is to be found. An increasingly obvious uniformity characterizes the endless repetition of the same form of life. Even the contrast of sex disappears at the lowest levels, and can be seen only occasionally in the contrast between the organs of procreation united within one individual. The stronger individual differences in various forms of life are contained in the characteristics of the first divine thought. In addition, mutual contact with other forms of life, conflict with the outside world, is important for bringing out the special traits in an idea. The importance of the individual's inner sphere is the key to the role which such exterior conditions play in shaping individuality. The higher the energy of an idea, the more complex is its history, and therefore a greater opportunity exists for external influences to change it. If it did not energetically oppose these influences with its own more powerful life, the idea would always be radically changing. The effect that surroundings have on the developing organism, which helps or harms it, can and must significantly change its characteristics. Its spiritual life and even the unconscious life of the soul are extraordinarily altered by a large number of influences. Thus all organisms, especially all souls of a higher order, contained and surrounded by many variations and changes. In the individual human soul, the differences caused by the various influences on its original pattern are enormous, even in the first stage of unconscious development. But in insects, worms and individual souls of equally minor importance, a great number of influences cannot cause any great or essential difference. These inquiries should be sufficient to explain how soul after soul continually emerges within the great variety of species. This should also, for the time being, satisfactorily account for the differences among souls.